Yeah, we designed um, our form of government from scratch mm -hmm. on the basis of these models, and nobody else ever did that. Welcome to Classical Etc. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Welcome to another episode of Classical Etc. Today's topic is U.S. history. But before we get to it, Martin, I haven't seen you in a little bit. What have you been reading recently? <laughs> um, I am. I'm. I'm. I've started another Raphael Sabatini novel, The oh. Carolinian. Okay, I think you're uh, stuck in a rut. You're all in on I'm, I'm, right I just, well, I go uh, on. I support this, see, this rut. Is, this, is, <laughs> this is one of those things that actually is, I think, good in reading. Is you, you, you get an author I agree. and you, 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 you go for it. But actually, uh, I'm also reading um, a book called, really one of the great education books, and we don't talk enough about it, is Teacher in America by Jacques Barzun. Jacques mm -hmm. Barzun was one of the great educators uh, he was a polymath. He he uh, he knew a lot about a lot of different things. Uh, he wrote the book. Probably his most famous to our generation is uh, well, I say our generation, uh, uh, other younger generation <laughs> is um, from dawn to decadence, which is a history of the last five hundred years. That was his last. <laughs> And some that's that book that you bought them all up remaindered and then oh, yeah. we couldn't find and you were running around telling people how good it was and we couldn't find it because you had <laughs> bought them all. I did. Yes. I was. <laughs> he was highly recommending it. And we, <laughs> he's trying, he's trying yeah. to spike the market. Yeah, there was a <laughs> local bookstore called Holly Cook at the time and they had, uh, had them on remainder. And I, I was doing the conventions in that time. I had other books in the booth, the Memorial press booth. So I, I bought all of them and then, I never did sell them, and I'm I'm going through my um, my outbuilding uh, uh, last year, and there's a whole big box full of those books that you couldn't find that we couldn't find. Because, well, he was so highly recommending yes. it, and we were like, "Well, we can't find it anywhere." And he was like, "Well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> yeah." So, uh, uh, so, but that that uh, that book is kind of, kind of considered Barzan's magnum opus, and he wrote it when he was, I think, ninety one. But oh, that's not oh a book you're reading. Yeah, what's the, say the title of the book you're reading? It was called, for, well, that I'm reading is called Teacher in America. Teacher in America. The, the, okay. His most more famous book that I was mentioning was From Dawn to Decadence. Oh. The Teacher in America was written in the 1940s. He updated it in the 1980s, but everything he says about education, he saw all the bad stuff that was coming. He knew what was wrong with it. Yeah. And he explained why. Yeah. Mm. So I'm still reading the Iliad, but I broke it up with, I wanted to find a fun book, but yeah. just different to read. And I had a funny experience. So you guys may have heard of this book because I've learned later that it's famous, but I saw this book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Okay. Robert that Persick. sounds awful. Yeah. Persick. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw Do you this have book. a motorcycle? I don't. No. And I thought. Wait, do you, do you have to have something to know something about it? I think, it's, why would you even be interested? It's just, why would I not be interested? It sounds like <laughs> fascinating question, in the right? art of motorcycle maintenance. I mean, what not to be fascinated by? So, okay. And I, 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 we were, I was just critiquing you before the show for not knowing things from our generation. And then you pick that. <laughs> that's the one thing you know. <laughs> wow. That's again, unfair, but all right. I didn't know it. I took that I, as a compliment because I had no idea what you were talking about before the show. So just take no. it as a compliment, uh, I suppose. Okay. Regardless. So, I, I thought it was nonfiction. I thought it was going to talk about, uh, you know, like how to fix and motorcycles motorcycle. and I thought it'd be interesting. So I got it on audio and right away, the opening lines, the character goes, I am Phaedrus. And then like all of a sudden a child starts speaking and I'm like, this reader is amazing. He sounds like a kid. Then all of a sudden a girl starts speaking. I'm like, this reader sounds like a girl and a man and a child. <laughs> this is the most incredible audio book I've ever listened to. And then I look at it more closely on my phone and it's actually a radio, a BBC radio performance of the book. <laughs> oh. And it was honestly a really interesting book. I mean, it's basically pop Buddhism, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a really interesting book that Phaedrus is the Greek word for wolf. And Phaedrus is a character in a famous Socratic dialogue. And it's kind of a um, fictional telling of that dialogue, but linking it to Eastern religions. It's, mm -hmm. I, I thought it was really interesting. Huh? Yeah, it was very popular back <laughs> I in the day. Would never have chosen that <laughs> in a million years. We, I mean, just blind without somebody saying, you know, here's a really good book. But well, have you ever picked something just because you like the title? Um, a, read a book just because you like the title? I don't think so. I mm. think I need more than that. Now, I have picked a book because I like the feel of it. <laughs> 
Wow. Yeah, it's not. Okay, well, is that any better? Than paper that's than that's totally the rational. Title. Well, yeah. but it has to also appeal to me. But I have picked beautiful books before, just because they're beautiful, and then I would look at the back, and it would appeal to me. But I don't. I would never have picked it up a book that like I thought. It was like 23 books you should read before you die list or something like I that. Mean, but I didn't read the description. I just saw the title list. and the internet. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, GPT. Okay. What much well, higher quality literature are you reading? Well, right it now? sounds like, I mean, the way you described it, it doesn't sound like what I thought it was. I literally thought you were reading a book about how to fix a motorcycle. Which Did you do. think that? Honestly, yeah. I thought it was going to be some like... Going in, I thought maybe it would be a correlation between kind of the the skills necessary to to maintain a motorcycle and like relating that to spiritual practices. That was kind of and that okay. kind of is what it is, but it was fictional, right? And yeah. okay, well, so I finished Jane Eyre, <laughs> and um, just really have a fresh appreciation for that book. And um, then I started reading. I'm taking a little break and reading um, Jacqueline Winspear's new Maisie Dobbs novel, which is in the crime fiction um, place. And so I've got all these books piling up that I don't have time to read because I've been reading more serious things. So I thought I'd do that. And then I'm still reading from Plato to Christ. And... So by, I by do Lewis have Marcus. to admit that I am, I mean, I do read, I made fun of you for continuing to read Sabatini, but I literally, if I find an author that I like, I start chronologically and I read the first book and I read every single other book until I get to the end. And that's what happened with Maisie Dobbs is I read them all and now I just have to wait for the new one to come out. And then if your author dies, it really mm. irritates me because then you're just done. <laughs> <laughs> how could they how right. could they, how could they do that to you right. account so I love to find somebody that's got loads of books right. and Sabatini I guess has loads of oh, books right so got you've got loads. and I need to read None some of more Sabatini I anymore. enjoy him yeah. going back to Jane Eyre Kyle's not here to defend himself so this is the best time to attack him right he, his main critique Kyle Yonke his main critique of Jane Eyre is that the ending is too convenient having just read it do you disagree with him or agree with him no, I to I dis I totally disagree. I think the ending is beautiful and exactly what it should have been. You know, it's a true love story about um, you know, she had the opportunity for a different kind of life and but life with him and and him the same, life with her. That was that that was all that they ever wanted. They nobody else would do. And I think that I thought that was a beautiful way to end it. Yeah. So, no, I totally I mean, in, disagree in, with Kyle. In that in that sense, all good endings are convenient, mm. right? I mean, why why is that a more convenient? He good just ending? is. He just loves Wuthering Heights so much better than Jane yeah. Eyre, and I just am in total disagreement with that. Yeah, and I don't. I think Jane Eyre has just as much appreciation of nature in it, and as Wuthering Heights, but I think Jane Eyre has so much, what's well, just, I think really for me, it still goes back to good things, goodness. Well, you mentioned mm -hmm. yesterday, I think hope. You, mm -hmm. Hope, definitely mm -hmm. hope. And just that, you know, that Jane Eyre also had this, um, this growing faith mm -hmm. that, um, mm -hmm. that was Im really important. And so it was all, I thought, just beautiful. It's very long. No, yeah. it took me a couple of weeks to read, but it it was beautiful. I'm so glad that I reread it. Paul, what about you? So I last night I finished Persuasion. Wow, good for you. Oh, by Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, still not, yes. yes. Uh, not sold on that one. Um, but I'll hold that for book club. I started reading Pinocchio. None of our listeners are going to come to book club. I know, but well, I, maybe I, some of them. I don't want to give few. Tanya. I don't want to give Tanya um, a something to, to think about. Yeah, and well, then come back at me. It's terrible with it radio, but okay. right. You know, um, just know that I was not impressed. I feel like mm. um, it. That's pretty strong. <laughs> I feel like it. It. it if a 
the overarching sentiment I came away with it from is that in order to be happy in a relationship, the woman ought not to speak her feelings until the man um, decides to say, I would like to be engaged to you. Which is that culture, that society. At very that unhealthy. Time. It, it is very unhealthy. It is. Un- I totally agree. But so it you're was judging the world- it by today's social standards. Yes, he is. Um, it's the world that sure, Jane Austen Sure, I am, in. because I was looking for something that's universal, and that is absolutely not universal. Mm. Do you think that Paul comes to books with a overly critical spirit? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is this, is this a... Just, uh, wait till I was... Martin, when I, this, okay. what I'm this, currently this reading. Seems this seems to be... Counterpoint is you come to the table with a critical spirit of me and Paul. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is that the healthiest place to be? I that point. <laughs> Um, so no, but so then I started reading also Pinocchio, um, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Oh, you like Pinocchio? Oh, Pinocchio is great. I I think I'm only like a quarter or half way into it. (laughs) It disturbs me. What, the talking piece of wood? Yes. And just the big nose thing. I just, yeah, I don't like it. (laughs) I think it's, I I haven't gotten uh, to the big nose part. I I think every, if the big nose part actually exists. Every boy should read it or have it read to him. (laughs) That that's really? it's, I, it's it's episodic and and it's these lessons that you learn. Yes, I mean it's lessons. very clear that yeah. I mean for a child to hear that those stories, they will be being taught moral lessons one after another. So wh- why did you decide to read Pinocchio? I was looking through my Audible account and I thought, oh, I have that in my Audible account. I've never uh, listened to it. I'll start listening to it. So, huh. but then um, my niece's boyfriend recommended East of Eden, which mm. I had, had been on my list. And I thought, oh, maybe I should go get that. So I went and got that from the library. I am only maybe a couple hours into it. I'm listening to it. And I am gripped. I am not going to put that thing down. It's so good. And you recently read it. No, I read uh, Grapes of Wrath. But I I would like to read East of Eden. Let's read East of Eden. I I love it. One of the directors of our trademark schools emailed me recently and said he had finished it. And he was like, you've got to read this. So, Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, we can't put... <clears throat> we can't put Steinbeck in our curriculum because he's just so Too raw. Gritty, yeah. Right, right. Um, but he's certainly worth reading for adults, um, college students, I suppose. I think I read yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised because when I was like in high school, we all had to read Grapes of Wrath. In high school? In high school. You were also in <clears throat> California at the time, right? And it was a local <laughs> author at the time. Uh, That's and, true. And it, it, Steinbeck is not like... Faulkner and Hemingway and these more modernist writers, he's really writing in the in the old, more heroic vein, I think. I mean, with a modern sensibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I and I think, you know, you don't hear a lot about Steinbeck really anymore uh, as a great author. And I I think that's because we have, you know, we're tr- you know, generally speaking, I think our our literary culture is trying to find things to tear down. And Steinbeck right. doesn't do that. He's just investigating human nature, and and uh, and doing it in this very epic way. And so it's very unlike. I think his his writing is very unlike the writing of any other modern authors because he's really writing in a more classic. I moment. feel like um, Steinbeck. I feel like when I read Amor Tolls, especially Lincoln Highway, yeah. that I just yeah. feel this Steinbeck like. Yes. Writing. I think if you had to compare without to somebody, all of the language, there, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Now, it's one thing Steinbeck writes about is America. <laughs> I knew that <laughs> was and coming. I knew that was coming. <laughs> and our history, especially in ex- history of expansion into the West. Yes. Yeah. So let me start you a are conversation. So smooth. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> yeah, that's evident. One of the most common questions we get about the Memorial Press curriculum, and then also Highland Side School, is that we dabble in American history in second grade, just a little small little book. Then we come back to it in sixth grade and then we come back to it in 12th grade. We only really give American history dedicated time twice. Most kids are going to get a state history class and a U.S. history class in their middle or grade school years and then also American history in high school and sometimes two years of it. So usually just yeah, twice the amount that we do. Why is that? Why do we spend so little time on American history? 
We used to do American history in every grade in the grammar school. And then, you know, it was the same, like it was a book just on a higher level, but the same history over and over and over because we're such a young country. And so Cheryl decided at that point that it would be a better use of our students' time to do geography because it would... um affect better the uh, their other subjects if they know where things are in the world. And so because we are such a young country, we can get that American history survey done in a year without having to repeat it year after year after year. So at that point, she did make a change, like a deliberate change. And so our students, by the time they get out of grammar school, can map the world. They know where everything is. They know most of the capitals. And so she just felt like that was in a time when they memorized so well that that was a better use of their time. And then when we do the American History Survey in sixth grade, seventh grade, um, at that point, they, you know, they're old enough to get it, to um, absorb it. And then they, in high school, we don't, you know, we're doing medieval history and we're doing European history. And so if we did American history every year, we wouldn't have time for those other subjects that do affect American history. And I would say also that when we study Roman history in the fourth grade or fifth grade, that we are setting the foundation for our American history study, right? which everybody knows our government was founded on the basis of the Roman Republic. So um, so it's not that we're ignoring American history. We're just not, we don't feel like it's the best use of time to repeat that same history year after year after year. It might be generous to say that everyone knows that, but I, I agree. Oh, that we... That oh, are, everybody are, knows the history? That the, the link between the Roman Republic and the American right. government. Uh, the other thing is... Oh, that, okay. Maybe. I feel like everybody knows that. Maybe I, not. What I've noticed that is many of the people who make that criticism themselves say that our children should have the same kind of education that the founders had. That the, 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 which was not a history which, of America. Which American. was not a history of yeah. America. It's what we're doing. <laughs> right. Um, you know, you, you have to... Uh, you know, if and, and and there's this, you know, one one of the things about American history and the figures and the founding and all that is that they're they're models. And so, if you're going to model yourself after somebody, you you don't just do what they did or learn about them. You do the things that they did. And one of the things they did was study classical history. Mm. Um. And, and, and I think this is important. We need, we, they need to be reading the things that our forebears were reading. And it, you, you can't do that and study the same American history every year. And I would be willing to bet that even though we don't do as much of it, they know it as well. Yeah. Oh, as, I agree. As, as schools that do teach it. Every and we don't year. ignore it. We are presenting <clears throat> it every year in um, fiction, um, narrative fiction, biographies. Um, we do recommend a set, but but even beyond that, if students are interested in American history, um, when I was little, I read every one of those little biographies that, where we have some of them in mm -hmm. our curriculum. Betsy Ross and Henry Ford. Yes, and, yes. Mm -hmm. I loved yeah. those things, and yeah. I just ate them up. Yeah, I'm I not sure too. what my – I don't remember my American history in grammar school, in school, but I remember reading those biographies. Right. I remember being at the library. I remember the smell of them, and I just loved well, them. Well, don't, don't you remember something like Little House on the Prairie far better than some account of America and the West and all that sort of thing? I, right. I think that, that was the other point I was going to make is that um, a lot of what you learn, and really I think the way you learn history best is through fiction. Through story. Yeah, you because then you get a real sense of what life was like back then right. rather than this very uh, bare and, uh, you know, sort of abstract type of knowledge that you're teaching when you're teaching just the facts about something. And I do think it's... Oh, go ahead. 
Well, I was just uh, in this conversation of history, I was thinking about actually history classes I took in college. And it was interesting because of the disillusionment that the students around me were having about American history in, in the, like how bad of a country we are because of mm-hmm. all these things that we've done. Um, but it was, but they had not been, none of that had been acknowledged prior to them hitting it in college. And so it was this massive disillusionment and like disillusionment with the country, not just with, you know, the individuals that made poor choices back in, in the past. And I was just trying to think about how that applies to the way we're studying American history. Like we're going through and saying, this is what happened. This is what happened. This is what happened. And we are presenting, you know, the way, same way we study classical history. There's, there's stories of, good people and bad people and, you know, people that have made mistakes and people that have, um, that have been heroes. And, but because we're not doing it every year, in some ways we're not, we're not setting up this sort of glorified, um, perfect Mm. narrative account that then is going to be, uh, undermined later on when they realize that, yeah, we did have Americans made made some mistakes choices. Yeah. (laughs) And the other thing, the other point I would like to make is that I think that um, school takes care of the subjects that um, that everybody's not an expert on. But I think that American history is something that I, as a a hybrid homeschooler, could take care of very easily. It was our country. We lived in it. I knew the history. It wasn't that difficult. It wasn't that big. And so it did It did feel like a better use of my kids' time at school not to do that. That was something I could take care of. And one time on a spring break, I decided we were going to do Kentucky history, and we we just took a road trip around Kentucky. We went to Daniel Boone's fort, which was closed, all that drive. And then they let us walk around the outside, but there was nothing to do. Then we went to Fort Herod, and we went to Shakertown. And my kids were just there. So the year before on spring break, my brother was stationed, I guess, at the Pentagon. And so we had a place to stay. So we went to D.C. And you come up out of that metro, and there's that beautiful architecture and that larger-than-life um, teeming city of our government, and then the next year I haul them around Kentucky, and it was just was <laughs> it was underwhelming. They could not wait to get home. It was just, it was like I would call that my epic fail spring break trip. But they did learn some things about Kentucky history. <laughs> you know, so the next time you want to take that trip, oh, that sounds fascinating yeah, to say, me. Say. Yes, well, it was not fascinating <laughs> to my two little boys. <laughs> now, Paul, I want to dig in a little bit on the point that our emphasis on classical history. I think actually does inform our approach to American history. How do you see the relationship between classical history and the amount of time we spend on that compared to the amount of time we spend on American history? Well, there's er, early on in American history, you're going to find significant references to classical history in the conversations they're having. So if you're just going to say, well, you know, whatever the the civil war ended in 1865 classical history is not going to help you much there right but if you if you want to understand the conversations happening at during the formation of the federal government understanding who who cicero is and and help me out with all the names in the federalist papers they um well alexander hamilton wrote under the name brutus right 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 and so, you know, he's make, by choosing that name, he's making a statement, mm-hmm. right? And so that, in, in some ways, just us contextualizing that for our students from the get-go, saying, here, here's a story, and then it coming up later is going to help them uh, with their American history, with understanding that. And, and when, when, they, when, they go, when, we, when we go to talk about what a republic is, which is what the founders set up, and which is a mixed form of government. I mean, Aristotle kind of talks about it. Uh, Polybius, the Roman historian, really doubles down on it, um, which is a combination of democracy and oligarchy and monarchy. And if you don't know what those things are, 
then it's hard to explain what a republic is. What are the pieces and, of a republic? And republican? the kids are going to know better what those things are by having seen them instantiated in different in, in history. moments in history. Yes, right. And in seeing them in the stages of Roman history, you can see it right there. All you got to do, because you see all those forms of government on all in one civilization in Roman history. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so you're just putting together some pieces that if you just go to it blind, you, you, you really don't have, if you just, study you're just American not going to have the richness yeah. of it. If you don't, if you haven't studied what came before it, it's just going to be a lesser experience with it. Mm-hmm. I think also all education in some ways is kind of selecting and deselecting information. I mean, there's so much that, that students can receive and the proximity to the events makes them seem more significant and in some ways, by gr- by grounding ourselves in, in past history, we allow time to help us in the selection of what, what history that we're actually putting in front of our students. Because if this is about helping them understand human nature, then they have a broader perspective on that when they see these same historical events playing out over the centuries and millennia, rather than just mm-hmm. over the last hundred years, this has happened and, and that you know, is unique to us and we're the only people wrestling with this particular issue. Right. And, and the other thing is th- that... Uh, other countries ended up the way they were organically because because of their history. They they were they were led up to the way they were culturally. Rome and Greece and those countries. America's the only country really that consciously designed itself the way it wanted. We're very unique in that mm-hmm. regard. We were very um, we thought about everything that we wanted to be, and all of that thought comes from that classical history. Uh, and, and so it's just important that we, uh, we know these models that the, that the founders were working on in order to understand ourselves. And we had to do that because we are so young. Yes. Because all, everybody else already had a history and we didn't. Mm-hmm. So we had to make... Yeah, we designed um, our form of government from scratch mm-hmm. on the basis of these models and nobody else ever did that. One um, topic when it comes to American history that I think we should broach at this table, although I'm interested to see where it goes, is that I think some people, when they talk about classical education, think that that's synonymous with a um, primary source um, version of teaching history. That is an, an emphasis on primary sources some people would see as equivalent to teaching history classically. What do you all think of that that concept and uh, how history should be taught in classical schools. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a, a kind of a utopian educational scheme myself. Um, primary sources are important for scholarship, but education and scholarship are two different things. Um, if you look at how young people were acculturated throughout time, it's always been done through retellings. Um, stories, little, um, you know, hero tales of your, you know, it was always done from secondhand sources uh, because what are, are you going to, are you going to be teaching primary sources in the, I don't know, second grade? Uh, you, you wouldn't be able to, you can't even understand the primary sources until high school or college. But even, but even in high school, right? Like you, if you, if you spend time on primary sources, you're going to cover just a very small fragment of a time period because that you to dig through that primary source to understand what it means is only going to give you that one that that one perspective on that one thing that happened. Whereas if if you read a a, a more broad narrative that is availing itself of all of a bunch of different primary sources, then you're going to be able the student's going to be able to get a, a fuller picture more quickly. But that doesn't mean that in high school you shouldn't bring in primary sources. You absolutely should bring in some primary sources because that's going to give them the real flavor throughout with, without an interpreter of what it was like. But it's this push and this tension between the amount of time we have and what your ideal world looks like. I we think. definitely in our high school American history are pulling in prim- primary sources, but we're also using a narrative textbook to tell the story. Mm. Yeah, and I think that the it it's important to make sure that we don't. You know, this is kind of the principle you you bring up all the time, and that is we see a good thing that is engaging with primary sources, which is a good thing, and then we lose the 
the foundation that holds that that thing mm-hmm. up. And that is, if you don't have a narrative text, then you you just have a teacher. And it, or if you don't have a teacher, you know who is who is helping the student to come into a mastery of these primary documents to give them the skills necessary to read them. There's usually a book, and there's usually a teacher. And to say all we need is primary source documents is losing the education part of education. <laughs> well, and uh, it's limiting it. That's right. Yeah. The, uh, an example that came to my mind is Thucydides, right? If, if, if we say that the classical way of studying history is through primary sources, then, um, you know, then maybe we might look back at the Peloponnesian war and say, well, then we can only read Thucydides. I mean, I, I was in a class with, with juniors in college and, it took us an entire semester to read Thucydides and they couldn't even understand it. You know, my, my peers couldn't understand it. I could because I was teaching out of narrative text to, to middle schoolers. Right. And so I kind of knew the broader picture so I could understand what was going on in that, in that primary source. But I mean, even the, the, the ancients wouldn't have said that they were going to learn their history only through primary sources. That is so funny because Nick read the Peloponnesian War in at Highlands in oh, high no. school. But <laughs> we it, don't do the, that anymore. But they would. I mean, it was a whole year. Yeah, it takes a long time to get to, it, and it's a very short window of time that it's covering. <laughs> right, and and you know, I, as being a logic teacher, and I've had this argument with somebody, uh, you 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 would never want to read Aristotle's. Um, uh, prior analytics in order to teach logic. You would never, no, no good teacher would ever do that. Primary source, right? The right. primary source. Okay. Because some things improve over time. Uh, logic <laughs> manuals are among them. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the logic texts of the, really of the 19th and early 20th century really were the best. And when I was doing my research for, for my logic text, uh, they had, they had, taken what Aristotle did and they had redone it and put it in a format that a high schooler could understand. Okay. That's not what Aristotle was doing. Um, you know, you don't want, you don't want kids reading the federalist papers when they're doing it. It's too difficult. It just, it's just too hard. You need, you need those, those interpreted for uh, younger people. And, and you need to be able to, you want, you're trying to give them the big picture. You're not, I think the primary source thing is partly a product of this, this emphasis, modern emphasis on specialization. And we're not trying to create specialists. We're trying to create generalists. And that requires something other, usually, not always, as Paul points out, you, uh, primary sources. So you say that we're attempting to create generalists. And I think that leads to my next question, which is, if you were to articulate, what is the goal of studying U.S. history? What is the goal of studying? Is, is it shaping the character of the students who are learning this history or is it giving them a certain set of content? What, what is the goal? And I, I'm sure there are multiple goals. I would say the story of our country with the emphasis on the story. Which they do need to know. Yeah. They do. I mean, it is part of history. Mm-hmm. But, but I also think you, the, the most important thing is that they know the broad narrative of it right so when when they learn something uh it, when i found um a cemetery on this land my parents bought and we start we started looking at the tombstones and all of a sudden there's a tombstone of a general i don't remember his last name started with a b i need to go look again beauregard uh we could go with that um <laughs> and he died in like the 1830s and I'm sitting here going, wasn't Beauregard. So, so <laughs> a man who was a general who died in the 1830s, buried in Kentucky. What, where, what would he have fought in? What war would he have fought in? Well, you know, potentially the Revolutionary War. Potentially the War of 1812, 1812. right? I mean, and but I had I had sort of the context for what you know what would have made this man important, um, and so. Kids don't need to be taught in my local school that General So-and-so is buried in the cemetery over here, but when they encounter this cemetery, they have the general information to be able to process that, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that's, I mean, I'm constantly finding new little tidbits out about American history and, and they're fascinating. And I don't, I don't 
um, fault my American history education for not having taught me that. that. It's because I was taught in sort of broad strokes of the important things that I can contextualize. And, and that those small tidbits actually mean a lot to me. Now, what do you think is the goal of U.S. history education? I thought I already said. It was, I think it's to, so that we know the story of our country and that we can put it within the context of the rest of history. It's just a small part. It's like a little ping because it's just what, you know, 300 year, I guess we're, I'm older now, <laughs> headed toward 400 years. <laughs> and, and but it's, you, a, it's a little piece of history. But I think it's really important that we understand that our place in it is just a small little blip in the in the whole world, in the in the history of the world. I think it's really important for students to understand that. And we, we sort of hinted at this before, but I think it's a point we need to make too, is that you, you, you're not only teaching history in history class, you're, you're teaching a lot of it in the books you read. And so, you know, Johnny Tremaine and all those kinds of books, yes. that's giving, Tom giving Sawyer, you a, Tom Sawyer, Sawyer. Yeah, right. Um, and then later on, uh, maybe in high school, certainly as an adult, you know, when you go to read, um, uh, Willa Cather, uh, My Antonia, um, A.E. Rollbag's Giants in the Earth, you know, all those, th those t as an adult looking back, those are the, are the things that really taught me history is, is these fic fictional and sometimes uh, autobiographical accounts of what happened. It's harder for me to remember loose, discrete facts than it is this these stories, all of which make up a larger story of, of how we got where we are. So let me listen on this. You are each readers and historians in part. Um, is there a part of American history that you find particularly interesting or that you've ever studied in particular? And I can, I can start while you all are thinking about it. I think I've always been kind of fascinated by Puritan New England. And mm. even I think Scarlet Letter is a great example of he's actually kind of writing as though it's it's his ancient history. The Puritan New England is a couple of generations past it. But the profound impact it had on, on literature, on religion in the United States, um, a really now a, a very irreligious place. Um, and that mm. kind of that dichotomy that exists in American history is uh, I, I've always found it really fascinating. I I really like to read about World War II, and I don't know if that came from my interest in Churchill, but I am really, or my just British lit, all the British lit that I've read. And Cheryl recommended a book to me once by Vera Britton, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was written by... Um, a woman who had lived through both world wars. And I think that made a real, a testament of youth, I think is the name of it. And just, you know, what it did. And I just am fascinated. We've just never in this country had to, had people bombing us. And I just feel like it's, like these are the strongest people that, and the way that they had to live and, you know, the women taking over and r helping run farms because all the men were gone, all of that stuff I find. But again, that story, I'm interested in it through the story of the people. I don't know about all the battles and all the the maps and all of that stuff. It really is the, the narrative for me, the people that lived through it and did it with such courage and did just what little things they could, you know, everybody working together. I find that fascinating. I like your answer is your favorite part of U.S. history is Britain during World War II. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. I've got this funny story. When we first did our timeline, unfortunately, that you know, I was saying it was so important for students to know what a small part we are. Well, that maybe that comes from my personal embarrassment. I was at a homeschool convention 
And a woman came up and she said, it's just like you Americans. And she was Scottish. She said, it's just like you. The date in your timeline book for the beginning of World War I is the year America got involved. (laughs) And the war had been going on for several years before that. And I was just mortified. (laughs) She was right. I mean, we had just messed up. It was just a mistake. But it was a huge mistake. (laughs) You know, it just made us look so egocentric. (laughs) Well, we are. <laughs> yes, and so I would like I would like our children to be less egocentric and to recognize that there is a whole world out there. Well, it's 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 easy to step on toes uh, if you don't know your history and you say something uh, imprudent. Um, similar story. Uh, I we were. It was at a Memorial Press booth. We were at some convention somewhere and my wife was helping me out. And this, this lady came, she was from South Africa. <laughs> and you know, there's different factions in South Africa and yes. you have to pay it. You have to know what they are and be careful what you say because, you know, there's, you know. and so one of her favorite books is Cry the Beloved mm-hmm. Country. And my wife immediately said, oh, have you read Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Payne? Well, it turns out this lady was an Afrikaner. And was uh, not sympathetic with the message in that oh book my at goodness. all. And, and, and my wife said, Molly told me when I came back, she said, I told that lady. And she just looked at me like she could kill me <laughs> and didn't say anything. and just walked away. Oh, no. Because she didn't know. Yes. These- <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it, yeah. It's it can be yeah, scary. You and I need to quit traveling. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I, as I get older, I'm saying more and more imprudent things. Well, um, and we have fixed the timeline card. It is okay. now truly <laughs> the beginning of World no. War. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I read. I had a copy of that my mom had bought me the Reader's Digest Illustrated History of World War II, mm. and it was a big sort of coffee table book. But it had a lot of articles in there and along with the pictures and everything. And I wore that thing out. I must have read that thing 10 times. I loved that mm. that book. So I knew a lot about um, about World War II. I also read um, William Shire, who wrote really the great book on World War II, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Mm. Um, also wrote a sort of a children's version called The Rise and Fall of Adolf Hitler. And I read that numerous times. Um, and then later on, you know, the civil war was, is always, you know, I think right. a lot of Americans has been a, a very well studied war, probably the most literate war, uh, ever, but there's so much writing being done by the people involved and, yes. all this stuff. and letters. Yes. And, um, uh, Shelby Foote's, uh, epic history of the civil war. That's on I, my list, but I haven't, I mean, I, to start that is, um, it, that may be my right. nurse, nursing home reading. Right. But <laughs> it, it's right up there with Gibbon's rise and fall of the mm-hmm. Roman empire and, and these kinds of works. It's, it's written in that way. And, it really and was a true there are history. some really good, I mean, I'm thinking David McCullough mm-hmm. is his books oh, about, uh, about American history and, are yes, so good. They are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, we have some great popular writers of history David McCullough is one of them. Uh, Stephen Ambrose is another. Oh yes. Um, I'm trying to think, there's there's another one that I've read quite a lot of, but the, they they're writing great history. They're great storytellers, and so mm-hmm. they they tell it in a, in a very interesting way. Um, and then you know the whole history of the American West has been a big interest of mine, mm-hmm. particularly for some reason in the last five years. Um, and there's this, there, we, we were a, we were a literate culture and we produced a great body of literature about, uh, the conquest of the American West. And, 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 uh, so I think there's just so much great literature out there that you can go to and, and read about these things. You yeah. Know? Um, the civil war is what has always fascinated me. Uh, I've, as a kid, I just remember just wanting to know everything about it. And, and it is interesting because it, it's, I mean, it's the first modern war, right? I mean, just the sheer right. amount of bloodshed because of, mm. because of the, the weapons that have been invented, um, I think took both sides by surprise, right? I mean, I don't yes. think, I don't, you know, I don't think we realized when that war started, what it was going to become. Um, and so, uh, you know, but also I think one of the things that, that fascinated me about that was that, you know, I lived 
in Kentucky where you can go see battlefields, right? You go, you go driving down the road and you pass a cemetery that's full of soldiers. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that I think made it much more um, tangible to me, much more closer to home. Well, and, and Shelby foot calls the civil war, the American Iliad, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so he's, He's uh, classically trained clearly in writing in, in, in writing that history, understanding the similarities between what happened and what Homer what Homer tells. Um, also, you know, I would I would also say that another great way to learn American history, um, and you can do this with your kids, is Ken Burns has is is an is an absolute treasure. Uh, he has done several series on PBS that are just absolutely outstanding. His, his uh, one on the civil war is so stunningly good and it's so beautiful uh, and, and compelling and frightening and, mm. and all these things. And what Ken Burns does is he tells the American history, he takes one thread and he follows it through. So the civil war is dealing with one event, but he's got a, he's got a one called country music and he tells the story of America mm. through country music. I mean, with, with the old, uh, fo- old, old photographs, but he, he, he's a really good storyteller. And there's one called Baseball. He takes baseball and traces it from its beginnings all the way through and tells you American history from another perspective. To me, that's the, that's the, way, the best way to learn history. But if you can, you can actually purchase those things and they're absolutely riveting, or your whole family can watch them. And, and I, I just really think Ken Burns is going to, uh, we're going to look back and, realize what an important figure he was so we don't do american history every year but it's certainly accessible to Mm -hmm. us it is accessible to us in our families and something that any family can you can get as much american history as you want easily yeah well i've enjoyed this conversation thank y'all for having it thank you for listening to this episode of classical etc if you enjoyed this conversation please consider liking this video If you want to join the conversation, then you can comment below. And if you want to stay connected, please subscribe to our channel. I hope you enjoyed this show and we'll see you next time.